Welcome to the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food. This week, we have a special live podcast recorded at London Food Tech Week, presented by Y Food. There, we were invited to host a session discussing the innovations taking a place across the blue economy, where we brought together experts to talk about whether technology is protecting or exploiting our seas and oceans. So without further ado, let's head over to the stage. Okay, guys, welcome to The Food Fight. I am Matt Eastland. And I'm Lakshmi Balatasan. And as you've heard before, so we work for EIT Food, which is an organization who are building an innovation community to improve food together. So throughout the uh, podcast series, we'll be looking at the key challenges facing the food sector. And the theme that we'll be discussing today is technology protecting or exploiting our seas and oceans. Yeah, so I mean, as the guys were saying earlier, so our seas and oceans are incredibly important. Not only are they home to like hugely diverse wildlife, but they also feed billions of people around the world. They provide income to millions of people as well. Our oceans and seas provide 50% of the oxygen that we breathe, and they absorb 50% of the man-made carbon dioxide as well. So extremely important. But unfortunately, after years of overuse and pollution, our oceans and seas are facing a pretty great challenge at the moment. And the uh, total amount of marine vertebrate sea life, including fish, have declined by a third since 1970s. And a lot of this has been attributed to the fishing industry. And it's also because of a worldwide consumption of fish has doubled since the 1960s. And the uh, global fish stocks is about at or below sustainable levels right now. Yeah, and so and as we've been hearing as well, so millions of fish are also wasted every year, so they're caught unnecessarily and thrown back, or they're accidentally killed in fishing nets and hooks. And to make matters worse, only about 20%, again, as we've been hearing, of the fish that's actually produced for human consumption actually makes it into our stomachs eventually. You know, an issue that uh, we've been hearing a lot now has been the plastic that ends up in our ocean, so 18 million tons of it a year. And I know a lot of you have heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So scientists have looked at, tried to analyze what type of plastic is in there, and 46% of that is composed of fishing nets. And these fishing nets, lost the sea, continue to catch and trap marine life, and this has been called uh, ghost fishing. So not only is that plastic harming the marine life, but then it ends up harming us because it just comes back and makes it back onto our plate. Yeah. So now is a good time to introduce our panel. So uh, as we say, so we're discussing the topic, is technology protecting or exploiting our oceans? Our first panelist is Thor Sigvason, the founder and chairman of the Ice and Ocean Cluster. Um, Thor is an Icelandic entrepreneur, speaker, and writer. He's written five books so far, I think another one coming, and he writes about topics on international business, knowledge networks, and salmon. Hello again, Thor. Our second panelist is Dr. Hordor G. Christensen, who's the Chief Science and Innovation Officer at Mattis. Hordor is also an adjunct associate professor at the University of Florida. He's a courtesy professor at the University of Iceland. He's published, uh, I think, 110 papers, chapters, and books, and he's either been directly involved in or founded several startups. So, hello again, Hordor. And finally, we're joined by Isabel Hoffman, who's the CEO and founder of Telspec. So Telspec's the company behind the world's first food sensor and is working with EIT Food to tackle fish fraud. So welcome, Isabel, and welcome everybody to the food fight. So Isabel, I'd like to start with to kick off with you today. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and also the work you're doing with Telspec? Hi, um, I'm actually a mathematician. Um, and uh, Telspec is my eighth company, so I'm sort of a serial entrepreneur. Uh, and Telspec was actually born out of a need to understand what is in the food. Uh, my daughter was sick, and uh, we, couldn't, we could pin down that the food was what was making her sick, but we could not really tell what was in the food that was making her sick. So I started exploring the idea of how do we build small sensors uh, that can actually read the molecular composition of food. And that's what Telspec does today. So we have a small sensor. It's a spectrometer, eff effectively. Uh, but it's small. The computational power is in the cloud. And we use machine learning to look at the calibrations, to actually look at the fingerprints that we're uh, reading. So it's a complex project, but it's bringing digitalization of the food into the industry. 
does much more. Of course, we can detect from the molecular composition some aspects of fish fraud as well. And we can detect the quality, the freshness of the fish, uh, the nutritional value, and some other ingredients. We may not go very, very small trace, close to trace ingredients because of the technology, but adulteration is very easy. For instance, uh, we recently did um, some classification models. We have over 10,000 scans of whitefish right now, probably the largest near-infrared uh, database of fish in the world. And we decided to divide the data and check if we could analyze uh, whether or not the fish was tilapia. We got percentage of uh, resolution in terms of predictability of 72%. Now, that's no longer random. That's already, you know, uh, substantial. I think we can improve that drastically. And as you know, panga is actually uh, one of the biggest issues in fish fraud. It's grown in Vietnam, most, most of the times in Vietnam. It's then uh, made into filet and sold as sole or grouper. Pangasius is typically sells for $4 a kilo, um, or 4 euros a kilo, actually. And uh, sole or grouper, we're talking about 15 to 16 to 17 euros a kilo. So that is not just, you know, lying to the consumer by paying more. There's other aspects, for instance, uh, escalior replacing tuna. Escalior is actually a fish that is detrimental to our health. It's been forbidden in the European Union and in Japan because it causes gastrointestinal problems in human beings. And uh, there was a study done by Oceana, an uh, American company that protects the oceans, with 146 restaurants in New York. Are they offering tuna? And not one of them was. So it's, it's very serious, this, this problem, uh, the food substitution. And we can detect that. With more and more data, we can really help. Excellent. OK. Thanks, Isabel. I mean, so I, you're talking about technology, about transparency and trust. I guess I've got a question for everyone that, you know, do we really need technology to support a sustainable blue economy? Or actually is the question that we should just be fishing less? So, Hordo, what's, what's your take? Oh, we, we need both. Yeah, they can't, you can't do, it, do either one. You need, you need both. Yeah, you need full traceability. You need to understand how well you're managing your resource. And then what you pull out of the ocean, you need to utilize it 100%. That's really our goal, 100%. Nothing gets wasted. Yeah. yeah. And Tor, I'm assuming Perfect you Perfect answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And so I guess, you know, um, it would be really good. I know you're uh, for Mattis and, and all the work you're taking. Sustainability, you feel like sustainability can be achieved. Um, can you give us some examples of some of the projects you're working on at the IT that are really focusing on innovation, um, supporting sustainable blue economy? Well, with the IT Food, for example, we have the communication project. We don't per se have a, a product development project on seafood, but we have fish feed projects, for example. Uh, one, one project we have is we're trying to find alternative ways to feed aquacultured fish. Currently, or in the past, we used to go to the wild, we used to harvest fish to feed fish, and now we're seeing more plant proteins being used, so we're using less wild fish to feed the aquacultured fish. But with the Yeti food, we actually are looking at different uh, sources of uh, protein. And one of the projects, we're looking at insects, and fish grows perfectly on insects. I mean, it naturally eats insects, so why not feed it insects? And in another project, uh, we're actually uh, using seaweed. So uh, the seaweed, not only can the fish eat seaweed, but the seaweed can have a positive effect on the microbiome of, of the fish itself. So the fish becomes healthier and you have a grows faster, gives you a better quality product. So that's, you know, those are two examples of EIT food project where we're trying to do better, you know, using, using less of the wild resource to feed aquacultured fish and, and grow more fish for the growing population. Okay, thank Great, you. Great, thanks. And, you know, picking up on that order, so going to tour, so is this just about fishing sustainably or is it also about how we behave with the fish that we've actually then caught. Yeah. I think it's, of course, both. And I, in many ways, uh, what has worried me a little bit is that I feel that often the media is depicting fishermen as pirates. It's so easy for us to talk about the over-exploiting of, you know, fish stocks, not doing anything other than just thinking we need to put sort of uh, some kind of policing over the whole industry in all countries. What, what I think we should try to do is to empower them, to get them more tools to do more with what they have, educate them and bring their children in, into the business sort of again somehow. And I think that's a, a great challenge for us. But it's something that is very worth, worthy the sort of uh, the effort, definitely. And uh, Isabel, I see you're nodding your head there. Have you got a perspective? 
Well, I, I was thinking actually that, uh, of course, to complement what you're saying, one of the biggest problems we have actually in the fishing industry uh, is actually the unregulated, unreported illegal fishing, uh, which happens everywhere in the world. I don't know if you saw the recent news, there was a, a big fish, uh, big boat that was caught by the Malaysian uh, uh, government. And this boat had been in the radar of, you know, quite a few of the regulators that it was doing illegal fishing. Um, they had inside a 28 kilometer fishnet. And inside the boat, um, there was about 12 to 14 Malaysian slaves, okay? Uh, they estimated that the boat alone inside had over $500 million of uh, euros of uh, annually of uh, fish. Now, this is irregulated and reported and brought into the food chain as if it is part of it. And what's, what's happening here is the unfair competition that these boats are giving to the fishermen. The ones that are following the regulations, the ones that are saying, I'm not fishing here, I'm giving an opportunity for these areas, for the, 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 the fish to grow again, for the, the resources to grow again. But meanwhile, there's, there's greed in the world, and there's people like these that are doing this. And technology here can really help. How? Well, sensor technology, satellites. Let's put these boats in satellites. Let's see where they're going. Let's scan the fish that, that exists. Let's see where they came from. Let's blockchain this stuff. Let's really track this from beginning to end and not accept this fish into it. Where, how does this fish get into our chain as legit fish? So, so that's a really interesting point. So how, how do we know then that the fish that we are buying is actually then caught sustainably? You know, so from a consumer perspective, how, how are we to know that these things aren't happening and the, food, the fish that we're eating is actually is a sustainable piece of fish? Like right now, you don't but we're living through a technology-enabled shift, which in 10 years you will, 10 to 15 years you will. But and whose responsibility is it to regulate that? So, I mean, you're talking about like this, this sort of data-driven future, but you know, who's going to be sort of regulating it, protecting us from that? I mean, I don't know, Tor or Hor, did you I have think, a... I think, well, we, in Iceland and Norway as well, many other countries have up to 90% of their cats being sustainably caught with the Marine Stewardship Council verifying all our cats. So we have these international bodies that are actually doing that job. And I think, uh, but we're talking about completely different worlds. So we think that the, the, the system that we've built is quite good for the, the areas that we're talking about. But uh, there's a challenge in other areas, of course. What do you think, Horda? Yeah, I mean, uh, and to add what Thor said, we actually in Iceland, you can't trace the fish to the actual harvesting ground. So, so we do have a, a full traceability system. And, um, you know, we would love to move that model to other regions. Um, obviously, it's, uh, it's, it's a very attractive business of a $500 million uh, or 500 million euro annual operation, you know, off the books. So, yeah, so it's wow. not easy to, to change the system, unfortunately. But I, I must start, though, because you were mentioning I have never taken that into account fully. But I was telling you that 50% of the cats is actually thrown into the ocean again by the fishermen. And there, there's nothing wrong with it. We think it's legal because it's the head and the intestines and the bones and what have you. The consumer takes then 35% off. You, you were down to 15% of that fish that's actually being used. Yeah. I, I think we should do more with the, with the 3D technology or, you know, <laughs> all these. Uh, but it's kind of, it's, it's so amazing. So amazing to have all, all this energy to be used to catch a fish that's actually being used for landfill or used in, into the to the uh, dump sites at homes, etc. So it's a it's an amazing opportunity to change that behavior. So even though we talk about illegal fishing, we have a responsibility as well in the developed countries to do much better than we've done so far. And so I think there is a, we can sort of look at ourselves and say we are responsible. Yeah, and I guess all of you have just talked about and technology is going to have this great positive impact. And you talked about blockchain and how that's going to bring traceability and transparency to the food chain. But I guess there's always just tech for good, but there's always taking things a bit too far. I'd be really interested to hear from your perspective, like how do we ensure that all this positive impact we're having tech stays positive and that how do we mitigate against the negative impact? For example, if we get really use technology to um, be able to find fish more efficiently, how do we make sure that it doesn't go too far and that we 
further on continue on with overfishing. Mm. Well, I can take fishing for example. I mean, people can see it as negative if you if you develop extremely efficient fishing gear because you can catch a lot of fish at one time. But if you have a quota system, then there's nothing wrong with it because you you're putting less energy into the fish you're catching. You're using less oil, for example. So I mean, there are two two ways to to look at that coin. So I think. In terms of fishing, yes, it has to be regulated. Um, and I would love for us not to throw any heads into the ocean, but uh, you know, the time will eventually come, I think. And we could use innovative technologies like what Holly is showing us today, the 3D food printing. You can actually take that cod head, you can separate out the meat, and you can print it, and you can actually make a fillet out of the, yeah. the meat that's in the cod head, for example, and, and the omega-3 fatty acids that are in the, in the, in the cod head, just as an example. And I think another thing that we, you know, we talked about with technology and regulation is like consumers are demanding more and we're getting more visibility in terms of where their meat and sort of vegetable projects come from. But there is sort of less visibility within the food and seafood industry. So, you know, as well, you talked about the technology that you're using that is bringing more visibility. But why is that? Why has it turned out there hasn't been much visibility and transparency in the fishery sector? I, I am a little bit worried that many of the startups that we have yeah. that have been dealing with traceability, all kinds of ways to make the consumer more aware of what the product is that's on the table in the supermarket. The problem is that the, often, even though we think it's otherwise, many supermarkets say consumers are not willing to pay at all for any of that. Mm. So we're actually kind of stuck with, uh, with all this beautiful technology but the industry is just telling us that no one is willing to pay an extra dime for more traceability, what have you. Of course, this might change, but this is just the case as it is today. The other thing is, and I worry a little bit about it, of course, is that there's a lot of gene modification in fish farming right now. I'm not talking about the toxics, but the, the tilapia, which is actually competing with the, our whitefish, we're learning that they're actually doing a lot of gene modification there. And I don't know what else they might actually be doing. So the, the customer awareness is, of course, a huge issue for us. But we're also having a difficulty, I think, with quality fish. Mm. Consumers don't know what a quality fish is often. That I, I mean, the, the US, which I've been so often too, they love fish nuggets. We don't have fish nuggets. I, when I was studying in the US, my family sent me, like my Greek friend, actually the whole fillets and whole fish to have in my freezer in, in where we were living. And my American friends always said, can I look into your fridge? And I said, why is that? I've never seen any refrigerator with these types of whole fish. We eat fish nuggets. So they had never seen, I'm, I'm, I'm overstating here, but the fact is, this is our challenge as well, to get the consumers and the, the whole public more aware of the quality. What is a quality and what should they be asking for in terms of the, the sources that uh, come bring bring the, the the fish. And so, how do we do that? You know, is it uh, you know what kind of technology uh, you know is being developed to kind of improve that uh, awareness? And is there uh, is there a role for startups maybe in this space to kind of to to do that to fill that? Gap? I think there's a huge role for startups. But once again, even though I'm always talking about tech, the main thing is the awareness of the people. We need to bring that up. We need to show people and and educate the consumers, the industry, and make it more of a, uh, make more interest uh, among the public about these issues. It's because you talked a lot about value in your talk, and I wonder, is it because consumers are really disconnected about where their food comes from and don't really appreciate the effort that goes into obtaining their food from them? And do you think that aspect has a place to play in increasing the value for food for consumers? I don't want to steal the scene here. I think it's the wallet. <laughs> it's basically the wallet. And you, people are just looking at their wallets and saying, well, if it's cheaper than, I'm an organic type, but this time I'm not buying into it. I had to do a little bit cheaper because of uh, the economic situation, what have you. So it's a very much a matter of that, I think, economics. Uh, like Thor said, uh, a lot of the, actually we, we, done, we did a pilot actually here in the UK. We developed an app years ago at Matis, I think 2011 or 2012, with a big supermarket chain here in the, in, in, in the UK. Uh, app worked perfectly, you could scan the fish, you could even see the picture of the boat, even the picture of a fisherman, you can, you can link whatever to, uh, with the app, recipes and things like that. 
but the supermarket didn't want to adopt it. They, they didn't want to give away too much information, actually, so, which was interesting. Not just about the, you know, it costs more, but there's a lot of other fish in their counter which may not have a pretty, as pretty story as the fish, you know, we were displaying, so like the tilapia or, or something else. So. This, this is exactly the yeah. problem. This is exactly what Matt asked, the question you asked. So how do we get there? Who's going to regulate it? Because the, the retailers um, are not that convinced that they should give that information. Interesting. But, I mean, the consumer is creating that pressure. And we see the millennials are completely different. They want a knowledge. So uh, it will change. And there'll be probably a courageous supermarket, a retailer, that will say, you know, I'm going to make this stuff completely transparent. I, I think it was too early, maybe the 2011. Yeah. Ahead <laughs> of your time, Mordo, ahead of your time. No, the other thing, was, what I like with actually this story is the problem was that it was beautifully fro frozen from the beginning. But when the, the restaurant had it, like fish and chips restaurant, and the QR code said this was caught six weeks ago, it's like uh, people don't n like to know about it even. They are sort of, it's like an old fish. So we were really proud to having all the information, but the, the information was something that the consumer didn't really want. Well. But, this, but this is what I see the difference in terms of the millennials. I mean, I happen to be a mother of a 20-year-old, and I see my kid has a, her own startup while doing university. And I'm having lunch with her, and she's chun 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 in a, in, a, in a phone. My phone is a computer, in fact. And she's not sending messages. She's in doing business. So, and it's this while doing a conversation, while talking with someone else, and why, whatever. And this multitasking is not happening in our generation. And these guys, they want to know. They want to know data. They want to mine data. They want to know what it comes from. Those are the guys I believe are going to change. Mm -hmm. I love it's that tough. story. My son is eating Kentucky Fried Chicken in Reykjavik. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess you're somewhat no, superior no, to no, me. No, no, <laughs> so we talked quite a bit about uh, the source of fish from the oceans, but you know the ocean has a diverse ecosystem. We're seeing a big push now towards plant-based diets. I know, um, Hordar, you mentioned al algae briefly, but you talked about it from a supplement point of view. So do you think there's more that we can do, like farming the ocean to supplement this growing need for plant-based diets? You know, any trends you're seeing there? Mm, absolutely. Seaweed is a big, uh, big trend. There's so many different varieties that we could, we could use. Uh, they vary a lot in the protein content, fat content. So yeah, if you, you can find a source that you can, you can uh, culture, I mean, that, that's a fantastic uh, plant-based, marine plant-based uh, source of protein you can develop for the future. Same with the microalgae. Uh, a lot of companies now putting, really putting up efforts to grow microalgae on a mass scale, so they can, so they they are the next alternative protein, the next alternative uh, omega-3 fatty acids, for example. So yeah, they're they're huge, huge opportunities. It's it's interesting with the seaweed, for example. Uh, you got to be careful. Uh, seaweed is also a, a a habitat for for mm. for fish. So so you you you, you got to harvest seaweed like just like you would harvest fish. You got to make sure you don't over harvest uh, the areas. So. And, and sort of staying on that, that sort of future topic, I guess, order, you know, so uh, you mentioned your presentation about companies which are now sort of printing, uh, you know, fish. And I know that Finless Foods is now do, doing the first lab grown clean fish. So can you imagine a future where we're simply growing or printing our own fish and actually we just, com we just kind of leave the oceans alone? Uh, that, that would be far, I think, very far in the future if that, if that ever happens. I think it's going to coexist. Right. Uh, technology, high-tech high foods are always going to coexist with, uh, you know, the more traditional traditional foods, and it really it depends on the consumer preference. So I, I believe both are going to coexist for, for for quite quite some time. Okay. And we're not going to have the food replicator yet that you saw on Star Trek. I don't know if you've seen Star Trek, <laughs> where you press a button and you you get the food. Sure, but, it's coming. But <laughs> I didn't know I would have an iPhone when I was growing up. So who knows? Mm. In hundred years. Yeah. And, you know, Tor, you, you know, for you, a big focus is on how the fishing community can embrace technology. So where do you see the future of traditional fishermen and fishing communities? What is your prediction of how the current community will look like in about 20 years' time? I think what's actually happened, we have some examples now in Iceland of fishermen that, uh, fisheries families, they tend to keep everything in their families, which is okay, but uh, fisheries families that are actually moving into these pharmaceutical level industries. And I think the challenge is going to be, are you going to take the step or is it, does it need a new generation? I in some ways think that we need a new generation because we, are ten we tend to be sort of all in our own boxes. 
even though we don't like to admit it. So the next generation is, is going to take the challenge. And, and um, given the fact that uh, this new generation is educating themselves, uh, this is going to happen. And I feel it so strongly in Iceland as we've been able to display in the media these new products. Even for Icelanders, some of it, uh, what Hörður has been saying and myself here, is new to many Icelanders. Uh, but they have come back to us, some of the new generation in Iceland, and saying, I'm actually from a fisheries family. I had no idea you could do all these things with, with, the, with our fish. Mm. So I want to come back into the industry. So I think we'll see the pharmaceutical part grow quite fast in the most successful fishing nations in, in the world. But we still have to tackle the basic fisheries. And what's going to happen is that we're still going to see processing moving to developing countries, which is kind of sad, uh, mainly because the energy that is being used just to transport the fish. But the good thing is technology is helping us a lot now. And only in 2014, the technology then was for each processor being able to do 80 kilos of fish fillets an hour. 2017, it's nearly doubled. Wow. So the technology is just moving so extremely fast with laser technology and all kinds of things that we're hoping that this means that we can actually do the whole processing in the local community in the future. So we, we, we hope we can, with technology actually, assist these communities to build their own industry sort of, rather than having to export everything abroad and then bring it back in a fish nuggets form. <laughs> this is sad in many ways. Thank you, guys. Uh, so I think, guys, we've completely run out of time. So thank you so much, everyone. So this has been The Food Fight. If you want to get in touch with us or get, go to our website, so it's eitfood.eu forward slash podcast. Or if you just want to have a chat with us, we're at podcast at eitfood.eu. But just to say, amazing panel, really interesting discussion, guys. So thank you very much. Big round of applause, please.